So let me just introduce myself and then uh, our uh, speaker for the evening. Um, very warm welcome to you. Um, thank you for joining us. There's an awful lot of interest in this uh, topic, as we can see from the number of people that have signed up. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to be talking this evening about uh, long COVID and the research that's going on in and around Manchester and beyond. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Martin Gibson. I'm one of the co-clinical directors for the Clinical Research Network in Greater Manchester, which is part of the larger National Institute for Health and Care Research. It's our role as the National Institute of Health and Care Research to um, carry out health and care research across the NHS and other care settings. My background is that I am a, a consultant in hospital. Um, my particular specialty happens to be diabetes and endocrinology, but I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to say that we have someone who's more of an expert in, in COVID research as a respiratory physician. So I'm going to be putting your questions this evening to Professor Noel Bakerley, who you can also see in, in, in the virtual room. He's a respiratory consultant at Salford Royal Hospital, which is part of the Northern Care uh, Alliance uh, based in Greater Manchester. Um, you've sent in already a lot of questions um, and we're gonna try and get through all of those. So I won't speak for too long. Um, if you want to ask a question during the event, uh, please post it in the Q&A button. We'll do our best to get around to answering it. Um, uh, just to make sure that we get the best sound quality and flow for the event, um, we have uh, sort of automatically turned off your cameras and microphones. If you find suddenly that you appear, uh, we, that shouldn't happen. But if you do, if you could turn off your camera and microphone uh, by the, uh, the buttons at the bottom of your screen. We probably won't be able to answer uh, all of the questions about uh, this evening, and certainly we won't be able to answer any questions that relate to an individual. Uh, and if you have concerns or issues around that, then obviously we would direct you to your uh, nearest healthcare professional, your GP, or if you have a hospital specialist to them. Uh, tonight is being recorded and you'll be sent a copy of the recording. Um, we have event arranged this event through the National Institute for Health and Care Research, or NIHR. It's a government funded body and it funds research in the NHS, but also in public health and in social care. And if you or any of your uh, family or friends that have been affected uh, by long COVID uh, want to uh, get involved in uh, being part of research, you can register with Research for the Future um, or, or be part of research. And the uh, instructions for that should have been included in the email you received with the login details for this webinar. OK. Uh, that's got through all the housekeeping details, I think. If you see me looking upwards and being rather vacant, it's because I'm looking at the questions that I'm going to ask now are on my screen. Uh, I'll try not to do that and make it look too obvious. But uh, I'm going to invite Nawar to give his introduction now and what he does, and, and then we'll get stuck into the questions. Nawar, over to you. Good evening, Martin, and uh, thank you very much for the uh... Introduction. Uh, my name is Professor Noah Bakerley. I'm a respiratory consultant, which means I'm a specialist in lung disorders. And uh, with COVID-19 uh, being a condition that affects the lungs significantly, I've been involved in the management of patients with acute COVID-19 right at the start of the pandemic. And around two years ago, and uh, around the time when we started to uh, find out that some patients starting to suffer from symptoms after their uh, infection with COVID-19 and we started to realize that there is something um, which we now know as long COVID. Um, I was involved in trying to understand this a little bit more so I worked with colleagues across Greater Manchester and nationally to put some service specifications for long COVID obviously being guided by whatever guidance that was available to us at the time. So I have um, uh, been part of a team who set out the blueprints of the long COVID services in Greater Manchester. Um, 
and um, subsequently I've put together a Greater Manchester MDT for Long Covid, which I chair at the moment. In addition to this, I'm involved in a number of NIHR funded studies on COVID-19 and long COVID, which aims to understand more the uh, condition and the treatment for the condition. So I've been involved in uh, long COVID, whether on a service uh, level or on a research level, right from the beginning. And I now run a long COVID clinic um, in my practice uh, within the Northern Care Alliance. Thanks, Now, Are you ready to get stuck in? Uh, to some questions. Let's do it. Thank you. Okay. The first question is is quite an open uh, question, <clears throat> uh, which is, what is our understanding of long COVID at the moment? Yes, and 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 that's a really good question because our understanding is evolving over time, and um, if we go back to the early days, we really had some very vague ideas of what long COVID could be. And what I'm going to perhaps maybe use is the definition of the World Health Organization of uh, long COVID. And simply this is um, uh, the combination of symptoms that are associated uh, with uh, uh, infection of COVID-19 and last for three months after the initial infection. Um, and this infection could be either a confirmed infection by PCR testing or a suspected infection by uh, a clinician. And if somebody continues to suffer from symptoms um, uh, after three months, then this is generally accepted to be long COVID. Now, the challenge here is what are the symptoms? And the symptoms are really quite diverse. And uh, the last at the last look at the evidence, there are more than 200 organs and symptoms involved in uh, what we know now as long COVID. Um, uh, uh, things like fatigue, like breathlessness, like tiredness, like um, uh, sleep problems, like brain fog and, and, and so on and so forth. In addition to this definition, uh, a lot of people also include in this um, things like conditions that could occur as a result of the infection with COVID-19. So for example, some patients who have had COVID-19 will unfortunately move on subsequently to develop conditions like scarring of the lungs or inflammation of the heart or inflammation of the nerves. And many clinicians would classify this as part of long COVID uh, symptom uh, syndrome. Um, Long COVID is a terminology we mainly use in, in, in this part of the Pacific, uh, the Atlantic, if you like. On the other part of the Atlantic, they use the post-acute sequelae of COVID. So if you hear the terminology post-acute sequelae of COVID or long COVID, they both represent the same thing, just different parts of the world. So our understanding is evolving. It's a diverse condition. It's a condition that could affect multiple organs. Um, it, it, some of the symptoms are clear. So um, some patients suffer from breathlessness that as a result of uh, scarring of the lung, that's, that's fairly clear. Uh, some symptoms are not clear. So things like fatigue, tiredness, brain fog, and our understanding over these is continuously evolving. Thanks, Noah. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in, and some of them overlap with questions that have been submitted as well. So the next question I've got actually does cover some of the things that are coming in live as well. So what treatments are available for long COVID? And some of the things that uh, people have asked about are things like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, steroids, anticoagulants, statins, antivirals. Uh, I don't know if you could cover off some of those. Yeah, so again, uh, a very, a very interesting question and also evolving answer. I, I, I hope to be able to give you the sort of the most up to date uh, picture of where treatment stands at the moment. And if I could perhaps maybe split this into three parts. The first part is treat conditions that happen after COVID-19 that we understand well. So things like uh, scarring of the lungs, inflammation of the heart, inflammation of the membrane around the heart, 
uh, sometimes inflammation of some parts of the nervous system. These are reasonably well understood conditions. We know a lot about these conditions from even before COVID had occurred. And some of these conditions occur with many other viral infections. And we have a, a reasonably good understanding to how to treat these conditions. So this is a treatment of a condition that happens after infection of COVID-19, and this condition is well defined. Um, some people will recognize um, uh, things like pulmonary fibrosis. This is a terminology that used to describe inflammation of the lungs. Some people will recognize terminologies like myocarditis, which is inflammation of the membrane, uh, inflammation of the muscle of the heart, or pericarditis, which is inflammation of the membrane around the heart. So these conditions we, we know and we understand and uh, uh, diagnosing uh, these conditions in the context of long COVID is, is not as complex as other conditions that I am going to talk about. So there are uh, already identifiable treatments for these and this treatment is what we use when we diagnose or these treatments what we use when we diagnose these conditions. There are other conditions that happen in the context of uh, uh, long COVID that we think we understand reasonably well. Um, uh, and our understanding is evolving over time. And perhaps maybe the most important one is what we know now as um, uh, autonomic dysfunction or autonomic dysregulation. In simple terms, this is a problem with the autonomic system, which is a very important system within our body to control our blood pressure, our heart rate, our bowel function, and number of other functions as well. And some people may have heard the terminology of POTS, the uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syn syndrome, which is when there is an inappropriate uh, uh, speed of the heart or racing of the heart, when somebody changes position or orthostatic hypotension, that's when the blood pressure drops, um, when someone changes position, particularly from sitting to a standing position. These conditions can happen, or we're finding out they are happening increasingly frequently in, 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 in patients who have long COVID. And we are now understanding more of what's the best treatment for those and uh, these treatments are proving to be successful. Um, we come to the final part, which is the third part, which is the tricky part, the part that we understand very little. So things like fatigue, um, chronic fatigue is one of the things that have been described quite frequently. Things like tiredness, sleep disturbance, brain fog. Um, we don't understand these very well. There are hypotheses or there are theories to how these can develop and can occur in patients with long COVID. Our understanding is improving over time. And I hear a lot of people talking about things like microclots and, 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 and using hyperbaric oxygen. Um, and obviously the, the, the hypothesis of microclots is a very strong hypothesis and it's generating momentum. Um, I think this, uh, the research that's first identified this uh, generated from South Africa, particularly during the Delta uh, variant towards the end of 2020, if you remember. Um, and, and certainly there are patients who do develop microclots. The, the challenge at the moment is microclots that occur based on the evidence we have is not like the standard clots that we are used to seeing in patients um, in, in, in other settings. So some of these clots contain material that's really not um, uh, well responsive to standard treatment, like treatment with blood thinners, for example, um, or treatment with aspirin. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty around the role of things like microclots and what's the best treatment. Um, hyperbaric oxygen is another one. Um, it's been, it's been studied. The results of the research is not conclusive. So at the moment, there is really no evidence based on research to support these treatments for the time being. 
Um, so hyperbaric oxygen is not currently recommended in any guidance on treatment of long COVID. Um, micro clots um, uh, are being studied more and we are hoping to increase our knowledge and there are a number of ongoing studies in the UK to try and understand them a little bit more because it's not about treating them, it's about diagnosing them as well. There is real challenge in diagnosing micro clots in long COVID because that you don't pick them up on the standard tests that we normally uh, carry out in patients where we suspect there are clots. So that is a challenge from diagnosis to best treatment and, and how to achieve the best outcomes in these patients. So this is the bit that is really quite challenging. There are at the moment um, guidelines to support the management of fatigue in general in patients, sleep disorders in general, but no, no specific um, uh, uh, therapeutic drugs that can be given in those instances at the moment, particularly specifically targeting uh, microclots. Um, sorry, Martin. <clears throat> I have to mute myself. From what you're saying, there's a lot of research going on into things like hyperbaric oxygen, anticoagulants, um, and other therapies. But there's nothing completely conclusive at the moment as to which patients might benefit from which therapies. Is that is that correct? That's that's correct. We 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 that, that's really quite a, a good point you're making here because finding out. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. If somebody suffers from fatigue, fatigue could happen as a result of a number of factors. So it could happen as a result of sleep disturbance. So somebody who's not been able to sleep very well. Um, and obviously, naturally, they become fatigued. If someone suffers from myocarditis, which is inflammation of the muscle of the heart, that could lead to fatigue. If someone suffers from autonomic dysfunction, which is inappropriate response in blood pressure, that will lead to fatigue. But also fatigue could happen as a result of microclots happening in the tissue of somebody who suffers from long COVID. So first of all, identifying the cause of fatigue. And when we come to try and work out, is it microclots? That's a real challenge because there isn't a definitive test to point us towards that. The next step is, well, let's assume we have a test to tell us whether there is or there isn't microclots. If there is a microclot uh, 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 disorder, then we don't know what's the best treatment for that. But knowing about the causes of fatigue, so as you've outlined, will help direct in the future the kind of treatments that we can offer, I think is Absolutely. what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I think the reason I mentioned fatigue, sorry, Martin, the reason I mentioned fatigue is fatigue particularly is the commonest symptom in, in long COVID. More than half of the patients actually suffer from fatigue. So not all fatigue is related to one cause. There are multiple causes. For it. I think that covers some of the questions that we've had answer, uh, sent in previously, but also some of the ones that I've seen coming in in the <clears> chat. <throat> okay, so moving us on to another question. Um, is there a link between long COVID and the development of other diseases? We've had people asking about autoimmune diseases like thyroid disease, hypertension, kidney disease and others. Is, is there a link? Does long COVID potentially bring on these other conditions? We, we are starting to see a signal, and it's a really good um, uh, quality signal to link those conditions to long COVID. So to give you an example, um, people who suffer from acute COVID infection, particularly if the infection was quite severe, and particularly those who perhaps ended up on receiving uh, support with ventilation or ended up in intensive care unit, are more likely to develop things like kidney problems. Um, most of these recover over time, but there will be a small proportion of people who will ongoingly suffer from some degree of kidney problems. So there is definitely a link between things like kidney problem and uh, long COVID. In terms of the link between long COVID and other autoimmune condition, I, I, I think I think there is really good quality evidence to suggest that there is a link. Uh, so to give you an example, um, uh, uh, some of the mechanisms that have been studied in long COVID point towards a problem with the immune regulation of the system within the individual. Um, 
uh, it's pretty much like a, 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 an overspell of immune reaction following the infection. So the infection happens, the body fights it, to fight it, it generates immune reaction, and that immune reaction is supposed to settle down after the infection is terminated by the immune system, but that settling down of the immune reaction doesn't happen, so it continues. And there are different hypotheses to why that would happen. So that hyperspill or uh, overactive immune system could lead up to other immune problems. And, and we've seen things like problems with hormones, uh, diabetes is one of the issues that we see frequently, well, not frequently, but we see commonly um, in, in patients with long COVID, um, uh, problems with um, the airways, similar to what we see in asthma, and asthma is a recognized immune condition. Um, uh, uh, a significant number of patients develop some uh, 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 asthmatic tendency, if you like. Uh, so either they've not had asthma and then they developed new asthma or they've had asthma and their asthma got worse. Um, some other hormonal problems, we're starting to see some signal pointing towards <coughs> hormonal problems in females. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so things like uh, menopause and early menopause. <coughs> Sorry about this. So we're starting to see these signals coming through. So hormonal problems linked to immune disorders are coming really quite, um, quite uh, strongly in long COVID patients. So the answer to your question is probably yes, but we need to understand that a little bit more. I guess I should have said when, when we <laughs> talk, you know, as medics about also immune diseases, there's a bit of explanation. What we mean by that is the immune system is attacking our, our own bodies inappropriately. Uh, it's getting a bit over over uh, overzealous and trying to attack itself. And and like you say, Noah, what that can spring from is that infection, that kind of cytokine storm that we've heard people talk about. And then then as a sort of mistake, if you like, the immune system continues to attack uh, uh, the parts of the body it shouldn't. And 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 some of those are things like diabetes, thyroid disease, uh, other hormones, like you mentioned. Uh, but I think I've also seen stuff about joint disease and rheumatoid arthritis and things like that too, uh, which have come into that category. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I, I personally seen a um, number of patients where their rheumatoid arthritis uh, flared up and became uncontrolled um, as part of long COVID uh, syndrome. Okay, moving us on to another question. I think we've covered a little bit of this already, um, but the diagnosis of long COVID has been a popular topic. So I think you might have mentioned this in your introduction, but just as a recap for people, are there any accepted criteria that a person must fulfill to get the label or the diagnosis, if you like, of long COVID? Is there any research taking place to advance the diagnosis and make it easy to do? Like, are there any blood tests that you could do or anything like that? See, that's one of the questions that's just come up. Um, what about those kind of things? So let me pick up on the second part, which is there is a single blood test that you can do to diagnose long COVID. The simple answer to that is no, is simply because it's a condition that could affect multiple systems, diverse problems, uh, and, and, and as such, is really difficult to uh, uh, come up with one blood test or even a combination of blood tests to diagnose long COVID. Uh, long COVID in one patient may be new onset asthma. Long COVID in another patient may be chronic fatigue. In another patient may be um, uh, problems with the with the nervous system. So it, it's really quite diverse and, it, and, and it's really difficult to try and capture that with single or number of uh, blood tests. Um, the other part of the question is that if there's an acceptable criteria for the diagnosis of long COVID, uh, the, the, the best we have is the World Health Organization definition. There isn't such a criteria. What what you know what's needed to have is a COVID infection, and that COVID infection is the index event. So that's the event that's generated the initial infection. Um, uh, we know that uh, there was a point at time in the past where PCR was uh, readily available. So it could be PCR confirmed. 
But now that we're moving away from doing this, um, it can be a diagnosis that made by a clinician. Now, we get into real difficulty here when we start to talk about long COVID in somebody who had symptoms that could be COVID or it could be any other viral infection like simple flu. And we know that there's a great deal of overlap. And I think that's a real challenge. I don't think we have a simple answer to that at the moment because you know what what people may know also is that most or many of the symptoms that patients who uh, uh, have with long covid can happen after any viral infection even simple influenza virus so uh, obviously the, the, the mechanistic um, uh, pathways or the mechanism of that for simplification could could be really quite different um, but at the moment there isn't really a worldwide accepted criteria to what long covid is other than what we know from the uh, World Health Organization definition, which I've laid out right at the beginning. There's a question in the in the chat that I think might apply to a number of people, which is, what if all of the blood tests and all the scans look like they're normal? Can, can somebody still have long COVID? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and, and we see that a lot. Uh, because long COVID, as I said, is not a diagnosis that can be captured by one test or number of tests. This is about the patient experience and the patient's symptoms. Um, and these symptoms cannot be ruled out by a negative test. Now, if the blood tests and the scans are all normal, that's hugely reassuring. At least we can assure ourselves that there is no damage to the organs because that would be visible on scans or blood tests. So that's hugely reassuring, but that doesn't rule out the diagnosis of lung COVID. Okay. So, and moving on to some of the popular questions. So lung COVID, what happens to people when they go and see their GP it was a it was a popular kind of theme in, in some of the questions. And many people mentioned their experiences when, when seeing their GP. So maybe we could divide this into, you know, how can someone living with long COVID get specialist support? What training is being provided to support GPs in the diagnosis? And, and how is the sort of diagnosis and treatment being looked at at a sort of overall care level, say across Greater Manchester or a bigger area? So uh, the, 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 this is a really important point because the government had invested a significant amount of money since the pandemic in the development of long COVID services. And since the end of 2020, the government had invested in something that we call uh, assessment services and then treatment services. So assessment is around how we can assess and diagnose long COVID. Treatment is how we can treat it. And as such, uh, 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 localities and health services across the country developed models of care um, uh, that start from primary care across into secondary care to deliver care for patients uh, with long COVID. Uh, I have to say, the, 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 this model of care evolved to different degrees in different parts of the country. So you can see some parts of the country where they, they've moved at a, a, a different pace compared to other parts. Um, and and that, that created quite a lot of frustration. And then that's an understandable, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I understand why patients would get frustrated when you know patient A in area A is getting access to services, whilst patient B in area B is is not, um, the, the 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 bottom line is that there 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 should be clear pathways that start from primary care to how to assess somebody who is complaining of symptoms that could suggest long COVID and a battery of tests that needs to be done, and. Uh, uh, areas across what we call localities nowadays, what used to be called uh, health authorities in the past or, or CCGs in the past, um, uh, th th now have set uh, pathways to how to assess, how to run initial tests and then refer into specialist centres. And refer referral to specialist centres could be either referral to a centre where there is a clear identification of a uh, uh, an organ that's damaged and then you know if it's the heart referred to cardiology if it's the lungs referred to a lung specialist but if you can't identify an organ there are long covid clinics that should run in in localities 
Um, I'm sure a lot of patients will come and say, well, that's not happening where I live. And I, I fully understand this, but uh, I, I think this is in, in, in this case, the, the, there needs to be a local discussion to why patients are not accessing this uh, to the same level at the moment. So the first point of contact for anyone that's concerned is always their GP. Is that yeah, right? That's correct. And then the GP should assess them based on the criteria that are available and the ones we've been discussing. And then that GP will make a decision to refer based on, is there an organ that's specifically damaged? Like you said, is, should I refer this to a respiratory consultant or to a cardiologist or to a specialized long COVID clinic? And, and in Manchester, do we have a specialized long COVID service like that? Yes, we do. And all the localities in, in Greater Manchester will have long COVID clinics that are run locally. Um, and these uh, long COVID clinics will receive referrals from GPs within that locality and then either deal with the, uh, uh, the problem within the clinic, within the expertise in the clinic for more complex cases, they can refer the, uh, uh, the case for discussion at the specialist long COVID MDT, which happens at the GM level, um, and, and then treatment could proceed from that point afterwards based on what's the best specialist to meet the need of that particular patient. Um, and, and there are multiple specialities that input into this MDT, including mental health, psychological support, uh, neurology, neurorehabilitation, cardiology, respiratory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, 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 we do have this model in Greater Manchester. This model also um, uh, is replicated across parts of the country. Um, some other parts perhaps maybe uh, are still in the development process. I'm going to just take a question that we had submitted and sort of amalgamate it with one that's just come in. So, and I think we've talked about this a little bit already now, but it might be bear a bit of re repetition. Lots of people give us examples of different symptoms of long COVID. They mentioned fatigue, cough, pain, rashes, and so on. Is there research showing what the most telltale or most common symptoms are with long COVID? And does that have any bearing at all um, on how long it might take someone to recover? So there's a lot of questions about, you know, is there something different about people that recover in three months versus, you know, three years? Is, is it a different condition? So, I mean, the important thing to mention, Martin, is that Everyone who's had COVID, regardless of how severe or not severe, is at risk of developing long COVID. And I think that's that's a fact that we, we need to recognize and appreciate. However, the probability, one for other word, the odds of developing long COVID is increased with the severity of the initial infection. So to give you an idea. Although everyone is at risk uh, uh, of developing long COVID, but the more severe the initial COVID infection, the more the risk of developing long COVID. So to put this in, in context, for those who end up in hospital as a result of COVID infection, uh, because they were severely unwell and they ended up in hospital because they needed to be in hospital, around 60% of them um, end up developing long COVID. So 60% is, is, is a significant number and, and, and that's not to be taken lightly. But for those who developed COVID but didn't end up in hospital because their infection wasn't severe, only about 25% of them end up in hospital. That's one in four, essentially. So there's a great variation in <clears throat> the risk and that's depending on how severe the illness. The good news is, that the vast majority of patients who develop long COVID recover by 12 months. Um, and, 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 and this is this, this data is, is, is well described in terms of you know, the incidence and the recovery, uh, recovery rate. Um, I, I can't remember your other point um, that, that you, you, you wanted to ask me about, but the to address the most common symptoms of long COVID, we, we know what they are. There is a great deal of understanding of what are the commonest symptoms that occur with 
uh, with long COVID. And as I've mentioned before, fatigue is the commonest one. Around half of the patients suffer from fatigue. Around 30% of patients suffer with breathlessness. Cough happens in about 20% palpitations at about 10% and so on and so forth. We know about brain fog, we know about neurological problems, we know about uh, gastric problems, mental health problems, um, um, uh, voice change happens in, 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 in some patients and that could be really quite life-changing as a matter of fact. Uh, changes to the uh, uh, sensation of smell, uh, which can again be, uh, be life-changing to some uh, patients. So we know a lot about the common presentations of long COVID and we understand that a lot. That unfortunately doesn't mean that we understand the best treatment yet for everything, but I, I guess you know what I mean. I think, yeah, the question I think was, is there a different pattern of symptoms in people that have a, a disease that goes on for years versus those that recover within a few months? Um, uh, yes, I, I know I know what you mean at the moment. Uh, the, the, the answer to that is no. Um, the more severe the infection, the longer it lasts. But there isn't a pattern to say that if you've had fatigue, you're likely to recover quicker compared to somebody mm -hmm. who possibly had uh, something like sleep disorder. But what we know also is if you look at conditions where there is organ damage like kidney problems, renal failure, kidney failure, for example, or inflammation of the heart, we know that these tend to last a bit longer. One of the things that I think is, uh, another of the questions that has come over, but I think it, it touches on another point, which is some people have talked about the sort of sense of hopelessness uh, with their long COVID. Uh, but I think that also overlaps with sort of feelings of depression and mental health problems that might be associated with long COVID. Um, is, that, is that a recognised issue, the mental health side? And can we give people any hope about that as well? Yeah, it, it, it is actually a huge issue. The mental health component of long COVID is, is devastating. So... Um, anxiety, depression, post-trauma uh, uh, disorder, particularly in patients who'd ended up um, on intensive care units. So post-traumatic stress disorder is a, is a big issue. Um, so mental health components are actually a very, very important component in, in long COVID. And that's why in our specialist long COVID MDT, mental health specialists are always present and their advice is absolutely invaluable. Um, can we give people hope? Absolutely, we can, because there are services uh, within mental health that are now dedicating their time and effort to deal with patients uh, who suffer from long COVID. And these mental health services should now be aligned to long COVID services across all areas within the UK. Um, so there is always, always hope. And also people can self-refer um, in some localities, for example, like Manchester, there's a self-referral process where people can go on the website um, of the long COVID service and they can self-refer themselves to the mental health service um, accordingly, mental health long COVID service accordingly. So uh, uh, absolutely, there should be a uh, a channel to refer these patients, uh, please do get in touch with the GP because they will have all the information um, uh, uh, on how best to refer into the most appropriate mental health service. We have to appreciate that uh, it, it, not everyone will require the same level of mental health support. Some people will, treat, will, will work with mental health workers, some people will work with psychologists, some, some people will require more intense uh, uh, psychiatric support. And I think um, there is clearly an overlap between some of these. <clears throat> it's obviously a viral infection, so post-viral infections um, and chronic fatigue. That you know we've known about that for a number of years, and there are chronic fatigue services as well. Is there learning from those that we're bringing into the treatment of, of long COVID as well? Yeah, absolutely, and. And I'm, I'm glad you called it post-viral fatigue rather than chronic fatigue syndrome because there's a slight difference. It's 
the, the, the features of post-COVID fatigue are similar to post-viral fatigue. There are some similarities. Obviously, there are some differences as well. Um, the, we, we definitely learn from chronic fatigue services on how best to manage fatigue in patients who suffer from long COVID. And the presence of chronic fatigue specialists is always uh, important in our long COVID MDT. Um, th there is evolving evidence in relation to how best to tackle this. Uh, things like avoiding boom and bust, um, uh, things like trying to manage performance on a day-to-day -day basis, um, um, uh, sleep hygiene, um, uh, chronic fatigue psychology is, is very important. So there's absolutely a lot of learns to be translated from what we know about chronic fatigue into post-COVID fatigue. And and we've done that to a great deal of success, actually. Shifting gears slightly and hopefully a little bit more uh, upbeat. Um, mm -hmm. What are the most promising strands of long COVID research at the moment? What can we what can we kind of get a bit excited and hopeful about? So the, the, there's an awful lot that's going on at the moment. We definitely are understanding much. Um, it, it, we do understand much more about this autonomia or autonomic dysregulation. This is the autonomic system. Uh, there is an awful lot that's currently being uh, uh, done to understand the what, what you described as the immune system becoming overzealous, uh, which is the autoimmune structure of long COVID and how we you know, we, we can dampen down the immune reaction that happens after COVID infection to prevent these symptoms from occurring. Because as I said, there is an immunology strand to how long COVID occurs. So there's a lot of work that's been done on that. The, there is a big study that's starting very soon to look at how we dampen the immune reaction down in these patients with long COVID. Um, there is also a lot of research to understand the symptoms a little bit more, something that we call in medicine phenotyping. Uh, and and this, this means trying to define what long COVID looks like in different people. Some people look differently to other people. So understanding the different features of long COVID. The, um, the NIHR in particular had invested a lot of um, a lot of money. Uh, the government had invested a lot of money. I think the government invested since the beginning of the pandemic about fifty million pounds in long COVID research, and the NIHR uh, had invested twenty million of that into um, into studying long COVID. So some parts of the research, which really I think is quite exciting, it's coming from Oxford, is to look at the changes in the lungs of people who suffered from COVID-19 using special techniques with MRI scanning um, and pick up early changes or early damage in the lungs. Um, there are also other studies looking at the, as I said, the immune system and how the immune system performs in the long COVID patients. And that's looking at different parts of the immune system because as the, um, our audience would appreciate the immune system is quite uh, complex. There is another study which is really important. It's called the Locomotion Study, which is looking at the organization of care and the best care models for long COVID. So if you remember, you've asked me about primary care and how does the primary care work and how they manage patients. And, and there's a great deal of variation of how different primary care physicians will address long COVID. And the aim of this study is to standardize the processes of assessment, uh, evaluation and treatment of long COVID using the expertise from around long COVID clinics in the UK. Um, so there's a great deal of research that's ongoing um, in the UK and worldwide. To add into this, which is also very, very important and, and also equally as, as uh, 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 exciting, is looking at the microclots. Uh, which is an area that is of great, great interest, because I know some people are very passionate around how microclots could be contributing to long COVID. And I, you know, I, I, I completely, completely agree with the need to understand microclots a little bit more so we can know uh, and learn better how to deal with them. And, and whilst we're talking <clears throat> about research and you said there's a lot going on in the UK, is there a lot going on locally? Could, and how could people, maybe some people on this call have either themselves want to volunteer or or they know people with long COVID that wish to get engaged? What, what, what's the process of doing that? What's the best way of doing that? 
That, 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 that's a really good point. We, we do have a lot of projects uh, that are ongoing in, uh, with long COVID research. Um, anyone who's interested in knowing about those or participating in um, projects that are coming up, um, they can express their interest in signing up to our research database webpage, uh, which I have copied and pasted into the chat, and I'll do that again uh, uh, now. It's called Research for the Future, and this is an NIHR project where People who are interested in research and participating in research could sign up on this web page, providing very um, uh, high level of information on you know, who they are, um, um, uh, what symptoms they have, um, uh, when they've had COVID. And, and by knowing this information about uh, the, the, the uh, thousands of people, then um, it'll give us better ability to recruit to studies that are coming up. So this is not about participating in a specific project, but this is about expressing an interest in participating in future projects. So if we get a project saying that I want to do long COVID research on this particular population, we invite suitable individuals from this uh, population and ask them to, uh, if they wish to participate, if they wish to participate, they um, obviously uh, go on to, uh, 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 sign a consent form um, based on their understanding uh, of what the study is and if they wish to do to, to, to proceed they sign the consent form if they don't like the study they still say, can say no and I don't want to participate uh, but we keep their details uh, with us if in case another study comes along and they might be interested in it in the future so uh, there are opportunities and i will uh, put that again on the within the chat please feel free um uh, to sign up whoever uh, 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 is interested so tell me if i got this right then so if people were interested they can look at that they can go to that website they they put in the a few symptoms and things and their contact details and stuff and that's not signing up to research as such that's just saying i'm interested and then, then the research for the future team contact them. How does it? How does that work? So, uh, researchers who want to conduct research, they will approach the research for the future team and say, "Well, we've got this research project, and the research project has been approved by ethics committee, and this is our research project, and we want to choose people who have long COVID, um, and meet certain criteria." So, research for the future team will go on and will search the database against the criteria. And they'll come up with a list of people who meet that criteria the most. And then they'll get in touch with these people and they'll give them a brief of what the study is about. And they'll tell them, we've got this research study. Um, this research study involves X, Y, and Z. This is a quick brief of what it, it is all about. Are you interested? If they are interested, then they are sent more information about the study. And if they approve um, uh, 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 participation, then they'll get invited for one-to-one -one meeting with the research team. And if they approve, they sign a consent form and then they be part of the study. So at this point, there's no consenting to any study other than being approached in the future about studies that could come along. Okay, that's very clear, thank you. Um, let's get back to another question. Uh... There's, this, I'll just tie a couple of these together. There, there have been several questions about long COVID research. What's the pipeline for long COVID research? And then there's another one in the questions that have come in this evening about, you know, it seems that the government and other people seem to be losing interest in long COVID now that the pandemic's over. So is research still being funded? Um, uh, what, what's, the, what's the thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a real point and that's that's a real worry to all of us. Um, uh, certainly at the moment, we we, the, we 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 don't know where the um, uh, the funding for research um, in, the, in the coming uh, couple of years uh, will will focus. Certainly, we all understand and appreciate that COVID-19 is not um, uh, uh, as um, pandemic as it used to be a couple of years ago or three years ago. So its impact on society has reduced. Uh, I mean, that said, we are still seeing patients who suffer from acute COVID-19 subsequently to this suffering from long COVID. 
How's the government going to react? Um, we, we don't know. Obviously, our job as researchers and um, long COVID specialists is to lobby the government and continue to put whatever pressure that we can put to try and make sure that funding is secured for long COVID. But unfortunately, at this moment of time, I, I certainly don't have any insight into where the future funding is going to be channeled um, for research into long COVID. And there's, there's a group of people, obviously, who are a bit more prone so that those people who are already immunosuppressed um, or, you know, maybe had a kidney transplant or whatever it might be. Um, what's been done about protecting them? Because COVID is still obviously a big threat to them. Um, and is there any specific research that uh, that's targeting the, those groups? OK, so that's that. <clears throat> I think there are two questions stem from this. The first one is who's most at risk of developing long COVID? And the second question is, what's the best way to reduce the risk of long COVID? So if we if we are going to um, look at the risk of long COVID, uh, probably better if we split the risk, who's mostly at risk of long COVID amongst people who really had bad long, bad acute COVID and ended up in hospital. So those who'd ended up in hospital. And when we look at this particular population, we found that females, those who have a, a high BMI, that's body mass index, um, uh, and those who'd received mechanical ventilation, those are the people who are at risk, mostly at risk of developing long COVID. But on the other hand, if we look at those who had COVID as a mild disease and they never ended up in hospital, then the, 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 the risk that those are at risk are slightly different. There is some similarity. So still females are at a higher risk. Um, BMI, uh, people with BMI uh, above 30, that's body mass index, are still at high risk. But we can also see that people from black ethnicity, uh, people who continues to continue to smoke, people who have other health issues, as you mentioned, Martin, and people, and, and that's really interesting, people from a deprived social background are at risk. So the risk slightly different based on what we have from evidence um, in between those who'd ended up in hospital and those who never needed to be hospitalized for the COVID event in terms of the risk of developing long COVID. So that's the first part of your question. The second part is that what's the best way to protect people from developing long COVID? And there is really strong evidence to support that vaccination is the best way to prevent long COVID because obviously it prevents from having a severe COVID event and prevents from COVID itself. Um, uh, 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 and as such, vaccination reduces the risk of long COVID. Uh, we, we don't know of anything else that reduces the risk of long COVID at the moment. So that, that's a, a question that has come up is, you know, what, what is the role of vaccines here? Is there really strong evidence that vaccines have reduced the likelihood of people getting long COVID? Is there any evidence the vaccine itself could make you more prone to long COVID? Yeah. Well, what's the issues here? Yeah, that's that's a that's a really really important point because we still we still are coming through a quite um, uh, strong views around the relationship between vaccination and long COVID, and and we all know that not not everyone accepted the vaccine in the same way, and 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 people. Um, sort of kind of a sat in sort of two different camps where some people were supportive of the vaccine and obviously took the vaccine while other people were uh, a bit more reluctant towards the vaccine. And I think I think that's really quite understandable considering the, sp the, the speed of how things moved over the last two to three years and, and, and people are concerned and I think we all appreciate and understand that. To, 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 to be absolutely clear, there is strong evidence that vaccination reduces the risk of long COVID. And I think this is um, inequivocal evidence. Now, does vaccine itself cause or carry a risk of long COVID? At the moment, there is no large epidemiological data to support this. Um, we, we do not have evidence from research to support that 
vaccine can be linked to development of long COVID. Um, however, that is said, I am, I still see patients in my clinical practice and through the COVID MDT that I lead um, uh, who develop symptoms that are compatible with long COVID after vaccination and they've never had COVID-19. Can I call this long COVID? The answer to that is I don't know at the moment because we don't have the evidence from research to support the terminology, using the terminology of long COVID in these individuals. In our own practice, we actually treat those patients as long COVID because if we don't, people have nowhere else to go. And obviously we can't leave people hanging up in the air. So we treat them as if it's long COVID after vaccine. However, we just need to appreciate that there isn't a strong evidence to support that vaccine can cause long COVID. Okay. A couple of questions, one that was submitted before mm -hmm. the event, one that's just come in just now, which uh, I, I quite like, which is um, all this research is great. Um, but where are the treatments? Are we going to, are we translating research into getting some new treatments? Is that just a question of time? Are there already things that have been trialed? What, 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 where are we at with that? I mean, that's a very important question because that's the crux of it, isn't it? I mean, the, you know, all this work, but what actually is the result? And, and the answer to that is, it, yes, there's a time factor in here because obviously treatments don't just come up overnight they have to be trialed they have to be tested they have to we have to make sure that they are safe and appropriate so we you know there are uh, as i've mentioned earlier number of research projects looking at treatments for long covid and we have to remember not all long covid the same and as i've described at the beginning there are treatments for established conditions there are treatment for conditions that we understand reasonably okay but there are parts of long covid that we understand poorly like fatigue tiredness breathlessness brain fog etc so there are a number of treatments that are currently being trialed and tested and it's a matter of time before we find the appro most appropriate treatment for the most appropriate combination of symptoms a long covid patient suffers from and then we, we sort of come back to the fact that the more people that get involved in those ongoing programs the sooner we'll actually have the answers so Absolutely. i guess it's a it's a little bit chicken and egg isn't it but you know We've, we've got to do the research to get to the point where we can fully establish that, yes, this treatment that we tested does work. This treatment that we tested didn't work. And, you know, if we go back to the um, pandemic where there was a big trial called recovery, which is very famous for showing that dexamethasone was helpful, that recovery trial also showed that a whole bunch of other things that we tried weren't helpful. But if we hadn't done the research, we'd never have known. And the same, I guess, is true for long COVID. Absolutely. And I, I think we you, you, you bang on the money, actually, Martin, and uh, we, we shouldn't really lose the momentum that we've uh, we, we've, we've generated with acute COVID, because we all remember that the uh, the UK was world leading in generating evidence uh, that saved millions of lives, actually, um, uh, because of the speed of how we generated evidence. So we can't we can't let that sort of go and we have to continue the good work that we're doing but we need to conduct the trials and we need to conduct them at speed and that's why you know um, uh, initiatives like research for the future could help generate evidence fairly quickly we are nearly out of time i just saw one question come in which i think is a useful one to just ask you quickly is is there a chance that long covid has any, an a, a, a cumulative impact so if you have multiple infections over time, does that make you more likely to get on COVID? It, 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 makes, it makes sense. The answer to this is we don't know. Um, there isn't epidemiological data to look at multiple infections and the probability of long COVID, i.e. if somebody had two or three infections, is their risk of long COVID increased? Or if they've had long COVID, could it get worse? We, we don't know the answer to that. Um, luckily enough, there aren't many people who um, uh, that develop multiple infections. And luckily enough, not, you know, not, not all these infections nowadays are severe infections. And we know that if it's not severe, the risk of long COVID reduces. So we, we don't have that data yet. Um, 
if you think about it mathematically, then the odds would be, yes, it, you know, the odds are increased if you get multiple infections. Um, uh, so if you get four infections, the odds of developing long COVID increases. Uh, that's mathematically, whether that is the case uh, realistically, we don't know. Um, the, the other interesting part is, you know, if you've had long COVID and you have multiple infection, could long COVID get worse? I think that's an interesting one as well. I don't think we know the answer to that. But we need to do more research to find out. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we are now just past eight o'clock. Thanks, Noah, so much. I mean, I think you've done a lot of talking and deserve to have a glass of water or something after all of that. <laughs> um, thank you to everybody that's taken part and for providing all your questions either beforehand or all the very interesting questions we've had. Uh, I tried to get around to most of them, I think, uh, as we've been chatting. Um, if you want to learn more about research uh, and uh, you would like to get involved, uh, within the email that you got sent, just to remind you again, is the link to the research for the future uh, system and also the be part of research websites which will both help you link into ongoing research uh, locally and nationally uh, we'd like to say a big thank you to long covid support for all the help with this webinar uh, you will be sent a recording of tonight's event if you can bear to listen to it all again uh, and you'll also be sent uh, an evaluation form, please do take a moment to complete that because we would really like to do more of these kind of events and we really want to know what what we're getting right and, and maybe what we could improve uh, in, in the format and the way we deliver this. Um, so it, it just remains for me to thank you all again um, for attending. Um, there's been a really huge turnout. I really appreciate you all staying on right to the bitter end. So thank you very much uh, for your participation and thanks again, Nawa, and I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Uh, thanks for coming today. Good night.